So, you think ADHD is harmless? That it just makes you a little quirky? Well, what if I told you that just having ADHD could shave up to 20 years off of your life? In this video, I'm gonna tell you about the dangers ADHD really poses, why that is, and more importantly, what you can do to gain back those years. Coming up. Hi, I'm Daniel, and this is Journey to Wellness. And here on this channel, I like to bring awareness to ADHD in adulthood and talk about what it really means to have it. If you're new to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss out on one of my weekly videos. Now let's jump into today's video. So if you've been watching any of my recent videos, you probably know by now that ADHD actually has some hidden dangers to it. If you missed those videos, I'll have a playlist linked in the description below. Now, one way ADHD can be hazardous to your health is through severe injury. And whether it's an honest, clumsy mistake or a hold my beer moment, we're prone to being injured more than neurotypicals are. Now, most injuries are gonna be relatively minor and wind up either being a cool story or a really embarrassing one. However, a good deal of those injuries could be serious or life-threatening. One particular injury that we seem to get more of is traumatic brain injuries, which can actually make ADHD symptoms even worse. In fact, a traumatic brain injury can cause ADHD-like symptoms even in neurotypical people, and even several years after the injury occurred. For this reason, traumatic brain injuries are usually suspected in adults seeking an ADHD diagnosis, particularly when there doesn't seem to be a history of symptoms or impairments. And not only are we at greater risk for head injuries, we're also at greater risk to have multiple head injuries throughout our lifetime. Just because of accidental injury alone, children with ADHD have two times the mortality rate before adolescence, and five times the mortality rate before the age of 40. This more so than neurotypical children do. High impulsivity, thrill-seeking behavior, poor self-regulation, and in some cases, a hypersexuality means we may have riskier sexual behaviors, leading to a high teen and unplanned pregnancy rate, as well as a much higher risk of contracting an STD. Impulsive and inattentive eating habits, especially when paired with poor sleep and lack of exercise, means that we are two to three times more likely to become obese, making it up to three times more likely that we'll develop type two diabetes, one of the greatest health risks in America. Because of a tendency to self-medicate, we're at a much greater risk of substance abuse, primarily alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, but this can also include illegal drugs as well. And if we do wind up using, we tend to use far more in excess of that of neurotypicals. Now any one of these things, any one of these behaviors, puts us at greater risk for cardiovascular disease. Once again, pretty high up on the list of killers in America. Even without the substance abuse and obesity, we're at a 2.4 times greater risk of diseases of the basal ganglia, some of which could lead to Parkinson's disease. Somewhere around 8% of us will develop Parkinson's as opposed to only 1% in the general population. All this being said, what does it mean? It means that just being diagnosed as ADHD as a child, we can expect to lose eight to nine years off of our lives regardless of whether or not ADHD winds up persisting into adulthood. Now, if that's not bad enough, there are two genes responsible for the transportation of dopamine, the DAT1 and BDH-TAC1. Just having these two genes can mean up to two to five years off of one's life. If you have ADHD plus these two genes, you're looking at up to 20 years being taken off of your life. To put this in perspective, the four leading health concerns in America are obesity, not exercising, alcohol use, and tobacco use. Having ADHD poses two times the health risk than all of these combined. So why does it seem like the deck is stacked against us so much? Some reasons are less education. 32 to 37% of us don't make it through high school. Corresponding directly to that, a lot of us are in the lower income brackets, making 24 to 25,000 a year, as opposed to neurotypicals making 37,000 per year on average. We have a higher rate of alcohol use. 
flat out. We are 43% more likely to smoke more than a pack of cigarettes per day, compared to only 11% in the general population. We're less likely to be in excellent health. Only 18 to 36% of us are in excellent health, versus 69% on average. And a real big one? We're far less likely to get a full eight hours of sleep every night. Only about 48 to 67% of us get the sleep that we need, whereas 86% of neurotypicals get the proper shut-eye. It all boils down to this. Low conscientiousness, poor self-regulation, and high impulsivity. Now I can relate to a lot of this. I'm obese, I was a smoker for several years, and even to this day, I still use oral tobacco. I get horrible sleep, somewhere in the neighborhood of four hours or less per night. I don't regularly exercise. And although I got my diploma by making it up in summer school, I didn't walk during my graduation because I failed high school. The only thing that I got going for me is that I feel like I've got a good sense of conscientiousness. What is conscientiousness exactly? Well, it's the antithesis to impulsivity. Now I know for a fact that I got my ADHD from my mother, but I definitely attribute any conscientiousness that I might have to my father. In the studies done, conscientiousness was the number one determining factor in how much of a health risk people posed to themselves. About a 31% variance in life expectancy was directly related to how conscientious or how impulsive a person was. So, now that we're all thoroughly depressed, I'm sure you're hoping that there's going to be some good news. Well, there is. There were nine main factors accounted for in the study. Years of education, weight, nutrition, exercise, sleep, risky driving habits, smoking, and alcohol use. All of which can be worked on and improved upon to the point of no longer being a problem, therefore giving you back those years that you otherwise might be losing out on. However, the biggest determining factor on whether or not someone is going to actually work on these areas of life comes back to conscientiousness. Those of us with ADHD have more than likely tried working on these areas of life and probably have failed. Take for instance, diet and exercise. One of the ways to have a fighting chance of actually improving these areas of life and gaining that conscientiousness is through getting treatment for your ADHD. Once you start being able to manage ADHD, it becomes a lot easier to implement change in other areas of your life. A good five steps to work on improving ADHD management are, number one, evaluation. If you've been struggling in major areas of your life in spite of knowing better, it would be a good idea to have an evaluation to see if ADHD is what's causing your problem. Number two, education. Learn all you can about ADHD from reputable sources. I would suggest organizations such as chad.org or attitudemag.com. I'll have links for these in the description below. Number three, medication. Now finding the right medication can be a process. A lot of take this pill and see if it works. But when it does, it's like putting on glasses for the first time, being able to see after your world has been nothing but a blur. Number four, modification. Medication alone won't do the trick. You're gonna need to work with a professional, be it a doctor, a therapist, or even a coach. Someone that has thorough and up-to-date knowledge of ADHD. They can help you to modify your environment to work better with your brain. And five, accommodations. Particularly if you're a student, but sometimes at work as well. Find out what accommodations are available to you as they can be a complete game changer. Now, a game plan is it's best to tackle your ADHD first. Get that managed and then start working on changing the other areas of your life to become more healthy. Doing this could literally save your life. So I'm curious, what aspect of this video stood out to you the most? Let me know in the comments section down below. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe for more. And until next time, take care of yourself and be well.